You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. And my guest today is Seema Kolsa. She's the medical director of the uh, ND Center for Sleep, meaning the North Dakota Center for Sleep. So Seema, thanks for coming. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you doing? Good. I know maybe it's, uh, you know, stereotyping, but when I think North Dakota, I think very cold. So I, I feel like, uh, you know, I'd want to go under the blankets and, and sleep all day there because it's so cold. Yeah, right? you... You wouldn't be wrong. We're under four feet of snow right now. So, yeah, you're pretty, really? you're pretty close. Yeah, it's, oh, it's no. unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, huh. well, um, all right. So what what got you into the, the sleep world and then why uh, North Dakota? So I'm a uh, pulmonologist. So after medical school, I did uh, my residency and then fellowship training. So it's about a six-year track after medical school. Uh, and I trained in, you know, intensive care units. And part of that is, um, believe it or not, you learn about lungs and you learn about the ICU and you learn about sleep. And so it was, um, it was something that I never really thought about when I was an, a resident. You know, I, I trained right before they limited resident work hours. So I actually fell asleep at a stop sign on my way home after right. being on call. And somebody had to beep their horn at me, you know, and I woke up and I was, I, I was, so proud of that. You know, for me, that was this validation that I've done this awesome job. I'm a good little intern. I worked myself to the bone. And it took an embarrassingly long time after that to realize how dangerous that is. And so then I started kind of understanding, right, you know, we all have this badge of honor that I'm going to stay up all night and I'm a superhero and, you know, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And it, it took a really long time for me to figure out that that's completely wrong and backwards and scary and dangerous. And so then I started learning more yeah, about true. sleep. Yeah, right. And it's something that we, I think it's popularized in uh, our media, even growing up in training uh, programs, even in the military, they would do sleep deprivation exercises. Uh, and even now the military has understood that sleep is important and they are training their troops about the importance of sleep and making sure that they get adequate sleep. So I really do think that we've seen this change in people's attitude about sleep. But like anything else, right, it takes a long time for people to come around and accept it. Yeah, I, actually, I go to an uh, acupuncturist. He's an Asian guy. And uh, he said years ago he fell asleep and, and like went off the road and got into this car accident. And he's like, you didn't die. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> falling asleep it's on the scary, road kill you easily. Well, and that's why the government's invested like millions of dollars on those on those rumble strips, right? Because this is a problem. Mm, yep. People fall asleep <laughs> behind the wheel. It's a problem. It's a huge problem. And we're just not, I don't think we're well equipped yet to try to, to navigate through all of that and manage it. But hopefully we'll get there. Mm. All right. So now you're, you're running the sleep center. So what are, um, you know, I've done quite a few interviews with people that, you know, run sleep centers and we talked about sleep disorders and we talked about apnea and, you know, things like that, you know, uh, insomnia. But how about some of the more unusual things that you see or the, you know, the pulmonary related sleep issues. So uh, I'll give you like one, one example of something yeah. that's happened to me. Like, um, you know, I used to get quite a few sinus infections, you know, when, uh, when it would, winter would come, the room would dry out. I'd have to use humidifiers. And, you know, when my 
sinuses would dry out. I'd, I'd wake up I don't know, 30 times a night because I was horribly thirsty and I'd have to drink water. And, you know, that was disruptive to my sleep. But um, I guess what I'm asking is what are the pulmonary related situations people have, you know, with sleep? Well, there's a ton, right? There's the sleep apnea is a breathing problem, right? Apnea is when you're just not breathing. And so that's the most common one that we see in the lab. But, you know, there's lots of other pulmonary reasons why people wake up at night. If you've got poorly controlled asthma, for example, sometimes people wake up at night with an asthma attack. People who have pulmonary disease like emphysema um, don't tend to sleep as well. You know, we have a lot of chronic medical conditions that can cause insomnia and, and fragment your sleep. And so it's really kind of interesting that I think there's this perception that you, you go to a sleep center and you go in on one end and you leave with a CPAP, right? That it's this one size fits all and everybody's got sleep right. apnea, right? And, and it's so much more than that, right? It's not just sleep apnea. There's all sorts of um, sleep disorders. Some are super common, like insomnia. Some are less common, like narcolepsy. I had one gentleman who um, had REM sleep behavior disorder. So this is this disorder where you act out your dreams. So normally REM sleep is where hmm. we have those wonderful watching a movie kind of dreams. And so our bodies are paralyzed. So that would probably, so we don't act out those dreams, but sometimes you lose that paralysis and then people start doing all these crazy things in their dreams. So I took care of a gentleman once his wife um, brought him in. He really didn't want to come in, of course. But he'd actually flown out of a window. He had broken really? through this window. Yeah, wound up on the ground, cut some scrapes, had to go and get stitches. And finally, his wife is like, okay, this is nuts. You need to go get checked. And he wound up having a little bit of sleep apnea. We put him on some medication for his REM sleep behavior disorder. And he actually did really well. I think sleep hmm. is kind of an interesting Maybe. thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, sleep is very intimate right? If you think about who has ever watched you sleep, it's somebody that you're close to. And so I think it's natural to have this apprehension about going into some sleep center where, you know, complete strangers are watching you sleep. And so there's definitely, that's an obstacle. I think a lot of people just don't want to come in because they don't want to have the testing A and B, they don't want to be stuck on a machine. Well, that's actually what I was exactly going to ask you. Are people resistant to coming in? And is it you know, do people voluntarily come in or is it like a loved one that says, hey, you know, you got to go and bugs them to go? So it's kind of funny. It's it's both. So in my exam room, I've got, you know, I've got this small clinic in Fargo, North Dakota, and it's just me and my, you know, my front office lady. And we have these small little clinic rooms and I have two, um, two seats for the patient to sit in, usually husband and wife or whoever, right? And if I walk in the room, I can always tell when a male has been sent by his wife because he sits in the seat as far away from me as he can get. And he really just doesn't want to be there. And so then we'll go through the typical questions. And, you know, I had one gentleman years ago that I, you know, I'd ask him these questions. Are you, do you snore? Do you, you know, are you sleepy during the day? You know, blah, 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 blah. Every answer was, nope, 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 nope. I'm fine. And then at the end of the visit, he actually pulls out a note from his wife saying, he has apneas, he snores, he chokes, he's sleepy all the time. <laughs> it was just really kind of funny that he just really didn't want to be there, really didn't want to go through the whole process, didn't want to be stuck on a machine, but clearly had a problem, clearly had sleep apnea. And so we definitely, it's definitely one of those things that is underrated. So, you know, I think we're really good if we have chest pain, right? We know that's a big, bad, ugly thing. We go to the ER, we know that's serious. I mean, how many people go to the ER because they snore? Right, very few people. That's true. And so people, well, right? And so people tend not to take it seriously. Well, it's in a, a lot of these things. You know, I, I would feel embarrassed. Like, you know, I did for a number of years until I lost some weight. I did snore, and you know, my kids would go, "Daddy snores." Daddy, you know, do you feel embarrassed? And I, you know, I thought, well, if we go on a trip and everything, maybe I should get a separate hotel room. I don't want to keep everyone awake. And I felt really bad about it. You know, and you feel like you feel like you did something wrong if you're snore, you have apnea or all that. So, you know, I'm sure that's what would make people not want to come in. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. And there's a stigma, isn't there? Years ago, I remember yeah. speaking with a, a young female who had, you know, this classic sleep apnea story. And I started asking her a few questions about it. And I said, oh, well, do you snore? You know, and she stopped. She got really upset. She looked right at me and she said, are you trying to call me fat? 
not at all. You know, tons of skating people have sleep mm-hmm. apnea. And it's one of those things you're exactly right. It's a little bit touchy, right? When we start asking about something mm-hmm. intimate like sleep, but also this sort of, you know, it, it's some people feel very judged when we're almost accusing them of having the sleep disorder and somehow it's their fault without recognizing that sometimes the sleep apnea comes first and then that leads to obesity, right? We don't yeah, want to... The problem is c- culturally sleep can be associated with being lazy itself. I mean, you know, like as if, for instance, I have, I'm like a super late night owl and people are like horrified when I tell them this and I've been going to sleep at like three and getting up at 11 for 20 years and they go, oh my God. And, and you know, I know society itself says, oh, the early bird gets the worm. You know, you want to get up before everyone else and get working. And so there's a lot of mental stuff surrounding sleep, a lot. No, you're right. But you're in good company. Albert Einstein was a, was a night owl. Oh, that's there's more data. So, yeah, see, so it's not so bad. And there's more data showing huh. us that if we align our work schedule with our circadian rhythm, we're, we're much more productive. And so you're right. Yeah, we have this great. idea that you've got to be up at five in the morning like the guys on Wall Street and, you know, go, 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 go. And sometimes it just doesn't fit with our circadian preference. And I think it's okay you know, you make sure you get adequate sleep. The sleep is good quality. And if you are fortunate enough that you get to live your life according to your circadian rhythm, more power to you. Mm. Well, I can tell you too, at, at, you know, at that point that I was storing a lot, I mean, who knows if I had apnea or not, but, uh, you know, my wife and the doctor said, you should go for a sleep study. And I resisted a bunch of years ago because I thought, you know, I don't want to go to like some place. And, and well, actually the sleep center said, oh, you got to be here and, and, you know, the sleep time is like 9 p.m. And then we kick you out at like 6 a.m. And, and I thought, how am I supposed to sleep at this place? It's it's a time where I never go to sleep. It's not my bed, not my pillows to be watching me. Like, I'm just going to lay there and not sleep at all. And they'll think like, I'm, I have, you know, I can't sleep at all and I'm no good. So that's why I didn't end up going years ago. So that was my thought you know, process and, too. And you're totally right. You're exactly right. You know, we we're fortunate where we are. It's, it's small enough that if we have somebody that has, sort of a, an a atypical sleep wake cycle, like a night owl, we'll let them um, come at the regular time and just hang out. And then we'll ask our tech to stay over or we'll make arrangements for someone else to take over in the morning and just let them sleep because we want to capture them. Yeah. It, you know, because it, it makes sense, right? You've got to capture somebody when they're used to sleeping or like, yeah. I don't think, you know, if I had to go right now and they said do a sleep study right now and go to bed, there's no way I'd fall asleep right now. Right. Right. Does that exactly. mean I have a problem? Yep. No. <laughs> that just means it's not my body's not ready for sleep yet. So yeah, it's it's it, well, it can't good. be a one size fits all, right? It it has to. You have to tailor it like anything else to the person. The goal is not to shove everybody into the same box, right? You know, there's a ton of different mm. sleep disorders, and I think you know I, I think you know we get a lot of media attention on obstructive sleep apnea, for example, right? And treatment and blah 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 blah. But the number one reason that we are sleepy as a country is that we just don't get enough sleep, right? We, we're we're yeah. distracted, we're on devices, we don't get enough sleep. Yeah. And then even even enough sleep, um, I've heard that, it, you know, for people, it's it's like in the seven to nine hour range. It's not necessarily eight. It's not necessarily seven. Have you found that same thing? Yeah, and you're exactly right. That's the latest data that was put out. You know, for years, we've kind of hedged our bets for when people say, how much sleep do I need? We used to say, oh, about six to eight. And then a couple of years ago, um, some groups came together and looked at the data and said, well, you know, actually it's seven to nine. It's a little bit longer than we thought, recognizing that that sleep need is a bell-shaped curve. And so some of us get by with less sleep and some of us need more sleep. Like ideally, I'm a nine-hour girl. If I could get nine hours all the time, that'd be fabulous. You know, there's no way I can, (laughs) but I would love it. I, I tell my kids that when they, you know, when they grow up and they move out of the house, I'm going to sleep till noon. You know, is that realistic? No, but it's, oh, yeah. you know, it just sounds fun, doesn't it? Well, you know what, psychologically, I, I literally just recently discovered that, you know, I, again, I still assumed, oh, eight is good. But in some situations where I set the alarm deliberately for nine hours, I was able to relax feeling I had plenty of time to get the eight. And then sometimes I did sleep nine. Sometimes I slept just eight, but I felt better that way. So it was like a psychological trick for myself. That's fabulous. I'm glad. See, it's nice that you're insightful and you've you've thought about it, right? You've you've analyzed yourself and you've figured that out. And it, and our sleep need varies from night to night. If we're super active, right? If we're fighting off a cold, 
so our sleep need is not carved in stone. And so a good rule of thumb is if you wake up on your own and you feel rested, that's probably enough sleep. True. Okay. Well, um, does, tell me how pulmonology comes into play with sleep. Like, What are some of the physiological things that happen maybe that people aren't aware of, that you are aware of? Anything interesting or unique? Well, it's all interesting. <laughs> I'm kind of a sleep geek, so it's completely all interesting. But no, right now I just do sleep medicine, but there's definitely overlap. So when we don't breathe at night, that airway closes and then our oxygen level falls. And so a lot of the time when our oxygen level falls, our carbon dioxide level goes up too and our, and our brain wakes up. And when the brain wakes up, that airway opens up again and then the oxygen level comes up and the carbon dioxide level goes down. And so it's really kind of incredible to watch this. So when we do sleep studies, we collect an incredible amount of data. We're watching brain waves, we're watching for sleep stages, we're watching for flow, you know, how much air is going in and out with each, you know, whether it's a full breath or a shallow breath. We're watching to see whether you're making effort, if your belly's moving, if your chest is moving, we're watching your legs, we're watching your heart. And so you can see somebody will be there and you can see that they start taking shallow breaths. You'll see that oxygen level start to fall and all of a sudden they'll wake up. And they don't realize they're waking up. Their brain will wake up just for, you know, a couple of seconds and they're right back to sleep and they're right back to doing that same thing again. And so if you have an underlying lung disease that already makes it hard for you to exchange oxygen, sometimes we see those oxygen levels go down super fast and really low, scary low. Right. And sometimes you'll even see that What's the scary low? go into the... Oh, like I, I, I had one guy that would drop into the 30s. So your normal oxygen level, you want it above 90. Yeah. And I, I was unbelievable. You know, at first you're like, oh my gosh, is that real? Is it the probe? That can't be real. And sure enough, and you put them on treatment and it just evens it out. It comes right back out. And, okay, really so cool. for low oxygen the, levels, it's the apnea yeah. mask, right? The CPAP? It is. Or, so sleep apnea is just an airway thing. The airway is collapsing, right? It's nothing that you're doing on purpose. And so you just have to work on the airway. So you have to splint it open with a CPAP, right? It's just an air compressor strapped to your head. <laughs> right? It just pops it open. Or you make the airway bigger. So you can pull the jaw forward with an oral appliance. It's like a bite block and it just pulls it forward. Mm -hmm. Some people do surgery. There's even an implantable device now. It looks like a pacemaker and there's it, it feeds a wire up to this nerve in your tongue. So it's really interesting. It's called the hypoglossal nerve. And so it's got mm -hmm. two components. It's got a motor component and a sensory component. So the idea is that you you hit the motor component so the tongue moves forward but you don't hit the sensory component, so there shouldn't be any pain associated with it. And so you turn this thing on with a remote, and it, it goes on at night, and all night it just pulls your tongue forward to, to treat the apnea. It's really interesting. So every, you know, everybody's different. Some people do great on CPAP. Some people hate it. We had one lady yeah, years ago. Yeah. Well, okay. she thought, you know, they put her on CPAP that, well, she, so she came into the lab. She had bad sleep apnea. And typically, if you come in the lab and it's obvious that you have obstructive sleep apnea, they'll just put you on treatment right away. And so they, they tried to put her on this mask and she thought they were trying to kill her. Like, she just did not like the mask. It was a horrible experience. We all had, I think, trauma from this experience for years. You know, this is many, many years ago at a different facility. But her initial reaction was that she thought we were trying to kill her. And really, we're just trying to help treat this chronic <laughs> medical condition. So, right? so we just felt horrible about the whole thing. I mean, we'd explained it to her ahead of time, right? And I don't think she just was able to put those pieces together. And so it just was terrible. You know, and some people do awesome on CPAP. Some people, you know, can't leave home without it. Other people do great with a dental device. Some people lose weight and their sleep apnea goes away. You know, there's lots of treatment for sleep apnea, but cure is either weight loss or you change the anatomy, right? You you do something permanent to fix that airway. And so all of this is Ma'am, this is not the euthanasia center. It's the sleep center. You know? <laughs> it, was a, it was one of these stories that, you know, our, our tech had shared with me after this terrible night. And I thought, oh, that poor thing. But yeah, you're exactly right. And so that's the goal, right? We're trying to treat, treat this chronic medical condition just like you would treat diabetes or high blood pressure or cholesterol, right? And, and the interesting thing mm. about it is that, you know, if you, if you look at the physiology of what's happening, right, that airway's closing, you're not just trying to treat the symptoms, right, with stimulants. You're actually addressing the whole reason that this is happening. So the airway's closing, you're doing something to fix that. 
And so that is right. what I really like from, it's a very pure way of looking at it. We're not just masking it. We're not just saying, oh, you're sleepy. Here, take some medication to keep you awake. No, we're addressing the whole reason why you're sleepy. Well, that's good. Yeah. Hmm. Um, any other, uh, like, well, out of seeing so many patients for so long, what, what insights are you getting that um, you didn't have at first? You know, what are some new thoughts or observations that you've had over the past few years? Well, you know, what's really interesting is that over the years, um, I think people are a lot more educated and a lot more willing to embrace this idea. You know, we have, you know, everybody's got a fitness tracker. People are monitoring their sleep. People seem a lot more engaged now than they were probably 10 years ago. And so mm-hmm. I, I think that's a positive, right? You know, I think I think some people really hate the idea of Dr. Google and these devices, but I really kind of love it. I, I kind of love the idea that people are embracing this and taking ownership. Like, this is my sleep apnea. I better learn about it, right? And then they're more engaged and they're more willing to do something to fix it, to treat it. You know, people come in yeah. all the time with their Fitbit or their Apple Watch or whatever, and we'll go through what it, what it tells them about their sleep, and we'll talk about it. It opens up that dialogue. So I think it's great. The, the one time it's not great, though, is when people develop this thing called orthosomnia. So it's where you start obsessing about getting those perfect sleep numbers on your tracker that you develop insomnia and you can't sleep and you're anxious. And in that case, we're like, you know what? Let's put it away for right now. You know, this is counterproductive and let's revisit it later. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So any uh, any trends that you're seeing? You said uh, people are using wearables. Do you think that, I mean, there's Fitbit and these other wearables. Some some doctors I've spoken to, they say, oh, they're, you know, it's good to have them. Some say, eh, they don't really measure very much. Maybe just time in bed. What's your opinion on them? So it's interesting. We um, So I'm part of this sleep technology committee for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And so we've been looking at this for the last couple of years and looking at the different technology that's out there. And the big the big question is, well, it says it does A, what does it actually measure? What is it actually telling us? Like what, when, when somebody shows me their Fitbit, what does that sleep score mean, right? How do, I, how do I bring that into terms that I understand from sleep studies, for example? And so some of the data is really interesting and some of it is terrible, but, um, and, but I like that they're analyzing it. I think it's important that we validate whatever is out there so that we know how to, how to interpret it. So I had the opportunity to speak with somebody from Fitbit a few weeks ago, and we were talking about, you know, what's on the horizon. So they have one of their devices has an oxygen monitor in it. And so they're kind of hoping, which is, of course, one of the things we look for in sleep apnea, right? And so in speaking with them, they're hoping to increase the awareness of sleep disorders, not necessarily diagnose it, but in the morning, you know, will we be at a point where in the morning, you look at your smartphone and there's a little message saying, hey, this is what we noticed last night. We think you need to go get a sleep evaluation. And then from that app, will you be able to click on something, find a sleep physician near you, and maybe launch an appointment via telemedicine? I mean, how cool would that be? Okay. I mean, it's amazing the technology yeah. that's out there. What's the rules on telemedicine in, in North Dakota? Are you able to do something like that? Because, I mean, it's small, but the population in North Dakota, I think, would be you know, segregated and, you know, widespread. So that might be a very helpful thing for you to do. Yeah. Telemedicine is great. We've done it for 10 years. It's fabulous. Nice. In fact, our telemedicine, yeah, our telemedicine no-show rate was way lower than our inpatient no-show rate or not inpatient, but in clinic. And so it wasn't unusual. So I would do um, like that first patient might be a telemedicine patient from one town. And then I would see a patient physically in Fargo. And then the next patient would be a telemedicine patient from another town. And so it, it's very efficient use of my time, right? It, it's mm. efficient for our patients. This is an agricultural community. It's really hard to get farmers in. And it's even harder to say, sir, we think there's something wrong and please drive 200 miles to see us and then drive 200 miles back home. And then next week, drive 200 mm. miles to come in and have a sleep study, right? I mean, sleep is it's already hard enough to get people in for sleep. <laughs> so we're just trying to eliminate as many barriers and obstacles as we can. We want to make it easy. Because this is such an important thing. Sleep impacts every organ system. You know, sleep impacts your eyeballs. It impacts your brain. It impacts, you know, you pick an organ system and sleep impacts it. We need to do better at recognizing and treating sleep disorders. Well, can you say more about that? 
you know, that it affects all these organs? Like, how does it affect your eyes? How does it affect some oh, of the other ones? Yes, yeah, so that's the coolest thing. So, um, so for memory, for example. So if you picture um, the brain, so I, I heard Dr. Um, Chuck Seisler talk about this a few years ago. And so he's this world-renowned sleep doctor. Okay, he was the expert witness at the Michael Jackson trial. And he talked about sleep and he talked about the brain. And so when you think about your brain, you've got these like ups and downs, right, in your brain. If you picture it, it's like New York City. You've got these big, huge, tall buildings and you've got these alleys in between the buildings, right? So all day, if you imagine people are tossing debris out of the windows into the alleys and then the garbage truck comes along and sweeps it all away. So they did animal research and what they found, they would have these little mice on these microscope platforms and when the mice would fall asleep, there was a change in the structure of their brain. And what they would see is that those big tall buildings would shrink and the alleys would get really wide and all that debris was swept away during sleep. And when they analyzed that debris, some of it is beta amyloid. And that's one of the substances that's been implicated in Alzheimer's. So this is really interesting, right? Is sleep protective for our memory? Maybe. It's fascinating. Yeah, when you sleep, when things I, get cleaned up, yeah. Yeah. Right. And so we had when I first so I'm Canadian and when I wanted to stay in the States, I had to work in an underserved area. And so I wound up moving to North Dakota from Georgia. And in my old office, there was a uh, an eye doctor that was right next to my office. And this guy was so smart. At least maybe once a month or twice a month, he would march a patient down the hallway, knock on my door and say, OK, you have to see this patient today. And yeah. it was some weird eye thing that he saw you know, whether it was like a blood clot in the eye or pressure or whatever, every single one had sleep apnea, everyone. And he would pick it up on an eye exam. Wow. Yeah, it was amazing. Huh. That's really interesting. incredible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's just so much, right? It's, sleep is a great equalizer. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're rich, if you're poor, if you're educated, if you're not, we all need to sleep and we need to sleep well to function well. And so that whole idea yeah, of I'll sleep when I'm dead right? It's, it's antiquated. If you don't sleep enough, you're going to be dead quicker than if you get adequate sleep and you're going to enjoy your life more and be healthier if you sleep well. No, that's true. That's true. Hmm. So um, what are some things that people should watch out for to tell them that they have a you know potential sleep problem? You know, the obvious ones and then the not so obvious ones. So the obvious ones, right? The witness apneas, you're tired during the day. Um, the not so obvious ones, if you have high blood pressure and it's really hard to control, like sometimes we'll get these guys in that are really, really thin and they're on two or three medications and they just can't get their blood pressure controlled. A lot of them have sleep apnea. There's a huge link with diabetes. So much so that if you get diagnosed with diabetes, you really should be screened for sleep apnea and vice versa. A lot of memory people, people who wake up with headaches in the morning, a lot of neurologists are really good about saying, hey, I think this morning headache is because you have sleep apnea and they'll send them into the hmm. lab for a study. Because you're right. Do you I think coordinate with, um, with, with, with doctors and other professions to, to tell them, hey, if yeah. you see this, it may be an apnea problem? Or they is that kind of overstepping your bounds? No, you know, it's funny because um, I think most physicians are open to that collegiality and that communication. And, um, for example, the cardiologists are actually really good about looking at their patients who have atrial fibrillation, for example, which is a really common heart abnormality. It's a rhythm abnormality. They're really good at, at recognizing that sleep apnea has a huge role to play in atrial fibrillation. And when they have a patient with AFib, they will send them in for a sleep study because we know that if they have sleep apnea and they have AFib, if you treat the sleep apnea, they have a higher chance of going back into a normal rhythm. And so it's, it's yeah. like sleep is an interesting, yeah, sleep is an interesting field that you don't just have to be a pulmonary person. We have neurologists, we have ear, ear nose, and throat doctors, we have psychiatrists, we have cardiologists that are sleep certified. Yeah, what, what kind of conditions have you seen that people have had? They've come in for a sleep study, they've had apnea, let's say, you know, they've been fixed, and then they say, hey, doc, my other condition went away, and they were surprised by it. So I had this guy years ago, he was hilarious. So the first time I met him, he was kind of cranky and, you know, didn't listen to anything I had to say. He was grumpy about having to come in for his study and blah, 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 blah. I don't want to do this. Anyway, so he comes back in for follow-up and he slaps his medication list down on the table. And he's like, I'm off my diabetes medication. I'm off my cholesterol medication. I'm off my high blood pressure medication. I'm even off my Viagra. 
you guys don't do a, bad, a good enough job telling us about this. <laughs> That's you know, great. You're right. You're right. We don't do a good enough job talking about that. But he's absolutely right. So he was hilarious. I had another guy who had a hat that said Krabby, you know, whatever his name was. And he would have his hat on all the time. And, and he came back in after his study and he sat down and he's like, well, I'm mad at you. I'm like, okay, what did I do now? <laughs> he's like, I can't wear my hat anymore because I feel great. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, he was, he was awesome. And I hear, you know, and it's not all, it's not all good, right? A ton of people come in and they hate their CPAP. And so it's not all roses. And some people, you know, feel maybe no different, but their blood pressure gets better. So it's a different metric for each person. Well, you seem to be a lot happier and uh, more encouraging and welcoming than, than many people I've spoken to. You know, like a lot of the doctors seem to be very clinical and dry or I guess worried about the seriousness of everything and just therefore not, uh, you know, they seem to be unhappy themselves. So it makes a big difference. You know, like, I feel like I'd want to come see you because you'd be happy, you'd laugh, you'd, you know, it would be a good time. So you have a good yeah, way a good about side. you, a good You're bedside right. manner, they say. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. So you need to come down to yeah. Fargo, but wait till the, wait till the summer because it's kind of miserable outside right now. Well, actually, that, that leads into my last question. So, you know, we're out of time. I was going to ask, uh, how can people get in contact? And if they're not in your area, um, you know, what are the rules of telemedicine in North Dakota where maybe they could do a consult with you even though they're not there? So that's really interesting. We've done, there are some states where you can do telemedicine um, from North Dakota to other states. So we've done it from North Dakota to Colorado, for example, a few years ago, but it does depend on the state where the patient is. Telemedicine is very patient centric. So it focuses all around where the patient is, which I think is quite lovely. So um, if they are looking for a sleep doc, they can go to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and just look for a board certified sleep physician. And that just means that you've had to do this exam and, and you've, uh, you've attained a certain um, credential to say that, yep, you've done your extra study, you've done your fellowship, you've done whatever, and you are board certified to perform sleep services. But no, we're just, I'm just, I'm a small fry here. I'm a small fish <laughs> in a small pond <laughs> in Fargo. Okay. And I've got a small clinic. But um, but no, sleep is a is a great field. It's a small field, and so a lot of a lot of the giants of sleep medicine are still alive and practicing. So you can actually meet them when you go to a conference. It's really kind of amazing. Yeah, what's it like to go to a sleep conference? By the way, is it uh, it's, is it exciting? It's awesome. So <laughs> it's fabulous. So a couple of weeks ago, we were in California, and I went to the sleep conference, and you get to meet these people that have written these articles that you've read. You know, like Dr. Morgenthaler, for example, is at the Mayo Clinic, and he um, was the first one to describe this particular sleep disorder. And it's just kind of amazing that you get to see these people right there. You know, you can go and talk to them. You can go out and have dinner with them. And it's really just so amazing. All of these people that are past presidents of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, most of the people I've met in the sleep world are very welcoming and they are enthusiastic and excited about sleep. And for somebody like me, who is a small fry, like small time practitioner, it's lovely to feel that embrace from, you know, these big, huge, well-known people. Well, that's great. Well, very good. Well, Seema, so how can people get in contact with, uh, with you or your clinic? Well, we have a phone number, 701-356-3000. Okay. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's been fun. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I always love to talk about sleep. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, but we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. 
You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.